Welcome to a why argue. We just had an argue. <laughs> Whether it's actually if they're going to argue, but what the intention is that it's a conversation on a very high intellectual level. No, it's a, meant to be a conversation that gives us a nuanced picture into what's going on in the world today. And today's theme is power out, and uh, we're very, very, very lucky to have Mons Lykketoft, uh, who is a leading political figure in the Danish political life for many, many years, and uh, um, just been president of the UN Assembly for the UN Assembly. Uh, and then we have Karen Ross, who is an accidental anarchist. He used to be a high fire in the <laughs> diplomatic world, but um, walked out when Blair went to war. Is that trying to say you were more or less? More or less, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we, we uh, urge you to have a, a, a very civilized conversation, but give us real insight to what your thoughts are about who should have the power today. Is it the big institutions, and how do you relate that to us as individuals? And, uh, and how you know, are we going to structure the future of our world in, in a, we could say, a very split world, in a 50-50 split world. Uh, so uh, I don't know who would start. We have actually not talked about that. But um, I think that institutions consist of a lot of individuals. And I know you also think that an individual can make a big difference. So maybe you would start on that note, Mons. Yeah, let me try then. Uh, I, I, I think we all have a philosophical problem uh, about what power actually is. Uh, and it, ha it hasn't become clearer to me over the years because at, at one point, uh, some 20 years ago, I was at, at least on one occasion described as the most powerful person in the kingdom of Denmark with those finance ministers. Uh, and that, 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 at, at that time, I thought a lot about it because, you know, I guess you're, most of you are Danes here, know that in this country nobody has had uh, chosen power at any point. Uh, and and, and I, I th thought about what was the, the power I had at that time. It was the convening power. It was the power to decide in a minority government, multi-party system with a lot of interests around in society, economic, social organizations and, and companies and so on, to decide who to call in and what to discuss at which sequence. Uh, and in that way, trying to maximize uh, your influence on the whole thing. But you never decided yourself. You had a position where you could uh, create the best possible decisions for the use you had, and for instance, when you were supposed to, to support, uh, by having the power to convene the right persons uh, in the right uh, role of, of, of about uh, the right things that has to be discussed and decided upon. Uh, that, that's, that's one observation. If you look at the world right now, uh, I think we, we have the problem that Joe Stiglitz, the Nobel Peace uh, Prize winner, uh, described to me when he was here in Copenhagen uh, six years ago, I think it was, he, he had just written the book about financial crisis. And he gave it to me and he signed it and we had uh, a dinner together, the two of us. And I said to him, Joe, uh, tell me what's in this book. Well, what's the, what, what's in, in one sentence, what's the conclusion? And then he said, uh, and then he said, uh, let me quote it exactly, uh, maybe we only have the best government money can buy. That was his overarching description 
of the United States of America and the reasons for the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Which I think is, of course, a simplification, but not, not that wrong. No, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I don't think we are quite there in this country, but, but on the other hand, you can say that we have one big global company, the most one, the most uh, conglomerate, and they have, uh, not to my extreme pleasure, but over the 30 some years I've participated in Danish politics, they've got an increasing influence mm. uh, on, on, on the political agenda in this country. Uh, but, but in the United States, of course, it's, it's, it's even more than that. You had a financial crisis because the, the, the big economic interests were able to buy so much, uh, buy in the broader sense of the word, get so much political influence mm -hmm. that they could dismantle all the regulations that were wisely established after the Great Depression in the 30s. And that they could again, some of their friends at least, again could gamble away all of it uh, kill billions of jobs, get the markets crash, uh, not only in America but in a large part of the world in, in, in 2008, uh, because we didn't have a containment of the greed uh, uh, in, in the financial markets. Uh, and uh, that is at least an expression of, of the fact that economic power is very, very strong out there. Uh, and when it is the case in the United States of America, it will uh, already for that reason, but of course also because its presence is everywhere to some degree, minor or major, uh, be uh, deciding for global developments. Uh, does that mean that democracy is not working at all? That's a good question. We, 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 uh, I think we are right now in a pre-revolutionary situation. So, some places revolution already took place, not to the benefit of the world, but it was a revolution that took place in the United States. It was a revolution that Britain decided to be the European uh, Union. Uh, we uh, have efforts to turn around the whole long-term agenda about the liberal world order uh, and, uh, and humanitarian principles uh, in all over the Europe at least. We have a number of, of disruptive crises emerging also because of, of uh, uh, also a little attention to, to the underlying uh, disequilibriums in, in the world, be it climate or uh, sustainability and so on. And uh, for, for, for all these reasons, uh, the, the, I think we will see the uh, old world order, as good or bad it was, being challenged very seriously. It can end up with something positive. Uh, we haven't seen that yet. But and what the American elections told us, in my view, what, what I got out of it, was that there was a deep, deep, deep discontent about what was not uh, possible to get grip on in changing society about the special interests, the, the traditional establishment, and the links between the political uh, establishment and, and special economic interests and so on. And there was a deep, deep uh, discontent and uh, uh, lack of, 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 of uh, yeah, a, a deep discontent and, 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 uh, and Fear for the future among a majority of, of people. Not that the economy broke down, 
unemployment was not that bad and so on. But, but people felt insecure about their future. But this is, I mean, if I may break in yeah, for yeah. a second. Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating analysis. But, uh, uh, you know, the question we're trying to answer here today is what to do about it. I mean, I think we all know we're in a severe crisis. Uh, I would put it much more radically than you. I mean, power to me is not complicated. It doesn't take much pondering. It's who gets to make other people do things. Yes. Bertrand Russell uh, analyzed it, though, in that way. Who's got the money? I would say who's got the money and who's got the guns? And that's power. And it's pretty clear that power is being ever more concentrated in the hands of a few. And you can't de-link a political system from the economic system. No. When you have a concentration of wealth like we're seeing today in the economic system, that is going to corrupt the political system. And that's what has happened. And I know everybody in Europe loves to point fingers at America as the kind of worst example of it. But it's clearly happening here too. Uh, you know, the left lost its way in the late 20th century starting to turn itself into a soft version of the right and you know sell off state assets, give up the idea of socialism and now we basically have one ideology that dominates which is a kind of market economics and there is no coherent democratic alternative from the left being offered and uh, what we're seeing is a slide to the right you know I don't think we're in a pre-revolutionary situation I think we're in a very major crisis now you know, and we need to think of what to do about it. And, you know, my proposals would be much more radical, I suspect, than yours, because I suspect you would say, you know, the answers lie in our existing institutions and that, you know, we need better politicians, we need more radical policies. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but mm -hmm. I would say the institutions themselves are the problem. When you have small numbers of people governing many, those, that small number of people is always going to be corruptible particularly when you have a concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. And what troubles me about, you know, the talk, the endless talk at the moment about the riot and Trump and yada, 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 is nobody is saying what the hell to do about it. And what we need is radical solutions, not more of the same. Well, what I was about to say is that I think the, the extreme increase in inequality and economic power in, in the U.S. has been uh, one of the, the really uh, troubling things. Uh, not that everyone realizes that that's what it, it's about, but the consequences of it. But go forward to totally different answers in the uh, uh, presidential campaign. You had Bernie saying, well, you have to redistribute, you have to reorganize, you have to do something like what they did in the Nordic countries. And that had a, 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 a rather substantial support. And, and the other answer was the same kind of answer we got during the 30s in Europe, uh, when you are uh, feeling discontent uh, and being pressed, afraid of the future, you react against those who are different, those who are blacks, those who are Hispanics, those who are Chinese outside selling products to you. Uh, too cheap and whatever, uh, and, and, and it was that the, the late the last of these two tendencies that won. But the strange thing I think is, when you think it through, what can we do about it? If the Democrats had nominated Bernie Sanders, we would probably have a president Bernie Sanders, because uh, the, the 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 uniting reaction was Hillary Clinton is the establishment that brought us to where we are now. We have to do something different. But the trouble with Bernie is that, you know, all he was offering was recooked beans from the uh, <laughs> in the mid 20th century. State socialism didn't work. You know, this is the problem. The left lost its ideology and became this sort of loosey goosey, third way, Blair, Clinton rubbish, and not a coherent alternative to, you know, what the right is talking about. And that is the problem we face now. Bernie didn't offer a coherent ideology. He talked about, you know, vague things about the minimum wage. His, his analysis of the world, for instance, of the Syria war, was absolutely kind of loony. He wasn't a particularly plausible alternative. And what we need is systemic change, not just waiting for some saviour. That's what bothers me about this analysis. And, you know, if I may, you know, traditional, uh, traditional political analysis is we need better politicians. We're all waiting for somebody to come along and fix it. And I think if we wait 
how it will freeze over first. How do you get uh, better institutions without better politicians? Make them democratic. Okay, yes, Make but that's, that's, democratic. that's an improvement to you, isn't it? I mean, you, 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 you will not get a change, a basic change in institutions without uh, politicians being able to explain what's really wrong about the distribution of power. And but they're not doing it, are they? Right. Because they, they are should. functionaries of that power. They are. They are functionaries of that power. Politicians are not able to independently stand up and point the finger at the banks writing the leg legislation, or the companies that have taken over state uh, state utilities, or the billionaires who fund their political campaigns. They're not able to do that because they are in their pockets. They have been bought by those interests. So we cannot intrinsically. It is. It is. You know, naive to expect that a politician will say this and deliver us from this. Yeah, but, but in, in this country, you can't you can't postulate that, that the politicians are uh, uh, bought by 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 a specialist. It's not not really. many. Some are. So why are, is the right rising here? Why have you got? I mean, Denmark is not immune from what is going on in Europe. It's, the right it's a lot nicer than what we're seeing in America, but you've got some nasty what? people arriving on the right <laughs> side. Well, the, 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 the so-called right, the nationalistic, the more or less xenophobic uh, movements uh, on what we traditionally call radical right, uh, is not in the pocket of special economic interests. Well, that's not the problem. The problem is that the, the Established political parties have, have not been able to address the concerns uh, about mass immigration and so on and so forth uh, that, that is out there uh, in, in, in a more, you could say, decent or regular way than, than the, the, the offers they give. But they, they are not uh, a a function of a special economic... No, but that's, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting the entire political system is corrupted by special economic interests. It's particularly brazen in America, but I suspect it's also here, it's just done more subtly. You, you just have to measure who benefits from legislation, who benefits from government decisions. And the rise of the right is a populist reaction against what people feel is a deep corruption of the political system, mm -hmm. a deeper sense of disenfranchisement that people feel they've lost control, and the right is exploiting that by pointing at the other, pointing at the foreigner mm -hmm. as responsible. And we all know that's not the case. What is in fact responsible is what mainstream politicians will not talk about, which is the, the fundamental fact that the so-called democratic system is now losing legitimacy has arguably lost legitimacy. Most people do not believe in democratic politics in the West anymore. Trust in institutions is rock bottom and still falling. And that is not about foreigners. It is about something much more fundamental about the system itself that needs to be addressed. And I don't think politicians will address it just as they won't vote, turkeys won't vote for Christmas. <laughs> no, but, but, uh... I understand the pessimism, but what's your answer? Well, my answer is to dramatically change the face of democracy and make it direct democracy, build dem democracy through uh, participatory processes at the local level where people themselves take decisions about their affairs, that we no longer look to another group of people, the politicians, to take these decisions for us, and we aggregate those decisions upwards um, to to the uh, level of mass scale, and this has worked in cities in Brazil, uh, where they've had tens of thousands of people take part in budget uh, debates and decisions. And it's a return, in a sense, to what democracy used to be in ancient Greece, where citizens took it in turns to take decisions. Mm -hmm. There's a real true participation. I think you're, you're right now in, in one of the countries uh, in Europe where decentralization of, of political power has been brought uh, most forward. We have a very strong, very huge part of what its public services is handled in municipalities to some extent in regions, even uh, uh, in spite of the fact that this con country is very small compared with what we know from, from Britain and from the US. 
uh, we have a very efficient for our structure. So uh, we can build on that, we can make it better, but, but, but that is not an answer to the question, how do you deal with global problems? Uh, because the other side of the coin is that you have not to answer on all the frustrations people have by uh, imagining or uh, postulating that, that uh, you can solve the problems people feel are out there and are really out there by building walls and, and uh, around local communities or small countries. There is none of the really existential questions facing humanity right now that doesn't uh, demand us to create a better and stronger international cooperation. I don't think that's coming anytime soon, I have to say. No, but... You know, but I don't, and but, I don't but, think that saying better institutions is going to fix it. And I do think, actually, that uh, you can deal with these problems of globalization at the local level, because that's how you feel them as an individual. You feel them as a community, you feel them at the workplace, and if you try to fix those things, and after all, we can't really fix anything else, I can't fix the UN, I mean, you did a little bit to fix the UN, but it's, uh, uh, and I give credit to you for that, um, but it's, it's not gonna get fixed in a way that will adequately address the very clear and deep concerns of populations around the world. To me, the only plausible answer is to do this locally, to try to fix inequality by setting up enterprises where everybody shares in the benefits and it's not just a profit-seeking uh, capitalist owner who gets all the benefit and having participatory democracy where you take decisions about your local hospital or your local school together. I mean, obviously there's a balance to be struck between the local and the centre, but I do think this is actually a, a, a tactic that is available to us. What I, I'm not hearing from the top down, anybody giving me a plausible answer that is going to quickly enough address the rise of the right. I think we're heading into neo-fascism pretty fast right now, pretty fast. And if we don't do something, it's pretty clear what the future is going to hold. Well, I think we are at the turning point. It can be very bad. It can also change in a better direction very soon. If you look at the, the, the European uh, political scene right now, you, you had uh, more or less as an automatic reaction to what we have experienced with Brexit and Trump that we will have a xenophobic outcome of the, the, the uh, elections in the Netherlands that didn't happen. What we see now, uh, next uh, great, great fear brought forward because we always, the media always, believe that what we saw was bad last day would be continued the next day. What we'll see now is an election in France where Le Pen will not win. But she'll be the biggest, she'll win the largest share of the vote in the first round. I don't think If that doesn't frighten the hell out of you, it should. <laughs> no. And in the Netherlands, I have, there is no reason for complacency about what happened in the Netherlands. Wilders didn't win mainly because the so-called centrist parties have moved dramatically to the right. They've changed their rhetoric about immigration. They've started, Rutte himself started talking about, you know, if you don't behave normally, then you can leave. This quote, you know, that is, that is what they could say in America, dog whistle politics. It's so, it's at a pitch that it's not overt, but everybody knows that it's basically racism that he's talking about. That you either be like us or you can leave. And he has adopted the rhetor rhetoric of Wilders. That is frightening to me because actually yeah. that shows that we're not just talking about you know, very unpleasant politicians like Vinders. We're talking about these ideas becoming the mainstream. That frightens me. Le Pen will win the first round. I think there's a real chance she will also win the second round because her opponents have been slowly knocked over one by one. It's like that game, what is it, Ten Little Indians. One by one they're dropping. Fillon is finished. Macron is a completely untested candidate. He's got no party behind him. I think she could buy off support from the, the Republicans on the right by saying, you'll be in my cabinet, I'll be mainstream, I'm not going to abolish the EU in the first year, and suddenly we'll have Le Pen as president of France. The, the, that's a very frightening scenario. I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. 
Uh, I didn't uh, believe in Brexit. No, no, I didn't. I, yeah, yeah, no, Brexit, yeah, I didn't believe Trump would have it, but that's also a consequence of a, a very strong election system in the United States. I mean, if it was the Danish election system. But the system, thing is that... We have another right. question. I mean, the, 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 you, you, you have been... Uh, the, the special interests and the old traditions and combination in the U.S. Uh, have created an election system that very often falls out with the minority being the majority. That's the, thing, uh, that's the, the consequence in, in Senate and in, in uh, House of Representatives and now also in the presidency. That, that, that's one problem uh, which uh, obviously couldn't happen here and can happen in France because of the two rounds. Uh, and I think, uh, maybe I'm too optimistic, I feel totally confident that she will not reach more than one third of the road seats. But if, if this, Mr. Likatov, if I may say, I mean, we've got to finish, but if this is where we've got to, that we're crossing our fingers <laughs> that uh, she mm -hmm. won't win, that in, you know, one of the largest democracies in the West, you know, that an overtly racist uh, candidate, you know, from a party that's for, founded by a Holocaust denier, you know, if that's the best we can do, we're in real trouble. You know, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's time to yeah. go. And also, we, we, the other thing about the far right is that people keep their preferences secret. This is what we saw in Brexit and Trump. You know, you don't have to declare that where, where you're going to tick yeah. the box in the ballot box. Know, you know, they know that it's not so politically correct to vote for these people, but that doesn't mean they won't vote, vote for them. Really, those that isn't your issue. But anyway, uh, let's make a, a better of that. Uh, uh, it will not happen in France, and, 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 and what, what we, will we see kind of, of possibly change in the whole mood about uh, things also in Germany? What we see right now is a new social democratic candidate coming up, being stronger than even Merkel, being an unbeatable Merkel. We will be seeing the alternative for Germany losing strength, pretty much. Right but this just plays to the thesis, doesn't it, that we've just got to wait for a few good politicians to come and rescue us. I don't think that's enough. No, but that's a, 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 not a sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition. <laughs> <laughs> well, two older white yeah. men having their views here. <laughs> <laughs> we have all the answers, of course. Yeah. And on that note, <laughs> half hour, time's up. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it, it is true it will take some years before the UN or the big institution will change uh, immensely. But I also think it will take some years before you have participate. what I don't know what it's called, but particip participatory. Participatory. I democracy can't say is in small, either. no, it's very difficult. <laughs> whatever democracy is in small units around the world, all over the world. So I think that we have to fight and we have to work hard. All we of have us to start to, now, Meta. What? We have to start now. You have to start now. You have to yeah. start now. Yeah. And thank you so much.